2020, starting with our first one on January 6th. Um, if everybody has kind of reviewed the agenda, first thing you'd like to do is approve the agenda as listed, unless there's additions or deletions. Make a motion to a second. <laughs> approve the agenda. Okay. Well, uh, Nat made a motion. Um, Jean seconded it. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda items uh, are minutes from December 16th meeting and a liquor license for Billings Mobile, Hen of the Woods, Prohibition Pig, and Craft Beer Cellar. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion to approve that consent agenda, please? I'll make a motion to approve that agenda item. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those who wish to approve the agenda, say aye. 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 Time for public. If there's anybody here from the public that wishes to speak, you're welcome to come up. Joe, you want to talk? Come on up to the mic. There's a little button on the back here. And just, yeah, Carl, look at it. What's on your mind? Joe Lumber. I uh, just have a couple concerns going on in town. I uh, want a credit bill. Uh, had a one-on-one -on -one with Bill the other day, very professional, very wanted my concerns, and he was going to address my concerns. Um, I feel a lot of waste going on in town, and Bill said that he was going to overlook it, which I have all the trust in the world in Bill to do it. Uh, Bill is way overburdened right now with taxes and everything else going on, but very welcomed me into his office to discuss the concerns. Mm -hmm. The only other couple of concerns that I had is why we're looking at a fire truck down by the sewers department, and we have one that's leaking water. Now, the one leaking water has been in numerous accidents on the highway. Why are we not taking the motor out of the other one or switch, switching vehicles, whatever. We have a perfectly good pumper out of one. And I was on the board to order these trucks. It would be an awesome backup truck. Yes, we do need two new fire trucks, I agree. They're, they're, I'm not gonna argue with Gary or anybody else. The one in the center is the most incredible truck I've ever seen. But we have a huge fire. We need another truck sitting around. It could be sitting in the center stage. You know, we could have two trucks in the center stage. Not a mini pumper that we use for a gate valve. We could have a thoroughbred. Now, I don't understand why it would affect our taxes, you know, and our insurance and everything else. We have the truck. We have a mechanic that's totally capable of doing it. Why aren't we doing something with it? Are you suggesting that we consider taking those two trucks and turning them into one and hanging on to it? Certainly. I don't know if Bill wants to speak to that at all. I think, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, well, um, that's one thing Joe and I didn't talk about on Friday, but um, it's something I can talk with Gary about. Um, we considered doing that instead of buying a new truck and we all agreed that given the truck's 20 years old we need to replace the truck whether it makes sense to spend i think i i think the estimate was around eight thousand dollars or so to switch the, the motors um, whether that makes sense to do and spend that and have another truck here that's really a, a question for the chief um, when we were going through the process of buying the, the two trucks that we decided to purchase, there were some members of the select board, Mark in particular, who wondered whether we already had too many trucks. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing with you, Joe. It's just that that's more of a firefighting question as opposed to a, uh, you know, my decision right now. So it's something I'll talk with Gary about. If we need uh, another truck that's clearly the cheapest way to, to get it. I'm sure you're not suggesting we go out and buy a brand new truck, <laughs> another brand new truck. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, uh, my question to the whole thing is, 
We have a town mechanic who's totally capable of swapping these motors. And we could have, we're paying him by the hour. We could certainly pay him by the hour. And, you know, we have an excavator that's a perfect engine hoist. I do this for a living. I, I personally could do it in two days. There, there's just no reason why it's sitting in a snowstorm. And my point to it, the one that's sitting down there hasn't been in four accidents. That, that truck has less miles than the one we have with the water leak. Why not give them the opportunity to have a backup pumper when they need it? We, we own them. Let's make one out of the rest of them. Great, we need two new fire trucks. I, I'm not arguing that. I, I no way am arguing that. But we could have an extra pumper. One freezes at 30 below zero, you still got another one. Well, I guess I can just say, I'll talk to Gary yeah, about that. Sure. And, and, and it's my understanding that we already had, uh, maybe it's an older truck that's a, a backup. We have three first, we so have, we have fir three first line pump trucks. Two were purchased in, in uh, 2000, one was purchased in 2010. And this year, you know, what we did at that special town meeting uh, is to replace the two that were purchased in 2000. In 2000. So we have three. Putting Joe's idea into practice would end up with us having four. four. One being just kind of a hanger on that until, until it really gives up the ghost, you can use it for something is what you're saying, I think. Yes. Okay. We, we own it. We have it. Why not use it? Right. Doesn't do any good sitting at the third point. The yeah, next next question is: uh, Do we have the additional room in the? Yeah, I that those in either one of the stations. So I have to so. talk to Gary. Okay. All right. I would say that um, Gary had made a point that the number of calls has been down. So I don't know. Of course, you could, it doesn't mean well, you would that, need it in an emergency. Yeah. But. It's it's not the number of calls that you worry it, about. It's, it's the, the one, it's the one, one call that you worry about. <laughs> yeah. The one big point, one we have. Point well taken. Yeah, like, we need it. You know, if you had an extra pump truck, I, it would still wouldn't have saved the Wallace Farm one more truck. Right. But if you had something like that, you want all. That, that's that. my biggest concern is we have it, or the other one's leaking water. Yeah. Let's make something out of it. Okay. Like, if well, we have to have two trucks, buy two trucks. We'll definitely touch base on with it on Gary and and see what we can do. Go from there. There. And my only other concern I discussed with Bill is I've been seeing a lot of stuff going on in town. Uh, a lot of waste of time. Using equipment we shouldn't be using to do something we shouldn't be doing. Um, Bill said he would take care of it. Okay. I'm going to leave it in Bill's hands till next month and I'll come back. If I don't see any difference, I will come back and bring it up. Okay. But again, Bill, you do more than we expect you to do. Nothing against anybody here. Um, just a lot of waste going on, management-wise, in the town. And it's time we can have a whole lot more things in this town if we took care of it. Yeah. Okay. It. Very good. Thanks, Thank you. Joe. Thank you. Uh, we're all set. Anybody else? No? Okay. So, Mr. Malter, how about throwing some trash at us? No. Off this time. Carla, why are there so many of these? Because Hen of the Wood and Prohibition Pig are owned by the same people, and they have like. Good Lord. There's two pubs at 23 South Main. There's three like outdoor catering permits, or outside consumption permits. There's some at nine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And you're also doing third class licenses now, which you didn't have to use to have to do before. Right. So there's like eight or nine for the two establishments. That was, uh, yeah, that was a new addition, wasn't it? Third class is hard liquor. Presumably, you want me to go to the witness chair? If you would.
Friend, Please raise your right hand. <laughs> oh, microphone, I love you, I love you. Green button there on the top. Is it on? Yep. Thank you, uh, everyone, and uh, glad to see it's nice and comfy in here. Um, the information that I brought is still a little bit in draft form. I was expecting a couple of more uh, documents for the uh, annual report. So don't put this one in the town report. But I wanted to give you something that's almost complete. And uh, I've got the pretty much final draft budget, the financial uh, numbers for the financial report uh, I was told will be available probably Thursday, and I'll get those to Carla, uh, so we can include that in the uh, in the uh, uh, town uh, report as well. I don't want to start out like Charles Dickens to say it's the best of times and the worst of times, but to a certain extent, it actually is. Uh, we have. Uh, been blessed by a, a really good awareness on the part of the public within the Mad River Resource Management Alliance in participating in our various activities uh, and especially in our household hazardous waste uh, collections to the point of uh, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're exceeding our, our grasp almost. We had 622 households participate this year in our two events. It reached the point where I actually had to hire a sheriff for our second event because uh, the traffic from Harwood was going out onto Route 100 and I was very concerned that uh, people weren't going to be knowing the event from the hazardous waste that was being removed but by the number of uh, other kinds of activities that were going to be happening. We wound up having the perfect storm in our spring collection. Uh, the school had had a, fair, uh, a period of uh, sporting events that were postponed due to bad weather and they decided to put them all in on the same Saturday that our hazardous waste collection happened to be. So uh, we had a double header of baseball, a lacrosse game, and uh, about 300 people from uh, the world of hazardous waste coming and visiting. It was uh, pretty exciting, to say the least. Um, but we did, as I said, have a, a really good turnout. Uh, Waterbury uh, was one of the highest participating communities with 31% uh, of the uh, activity, the people bringing their stuff. Now, that could be taken several ways, of course, meaning that people here in Waterbury just have too much bad stuff and uh, should be looking at less toxic alternatives, or they are just uh, being very aware of uh, their environment and uh, want to do the right thing, and I think that probably is it, pretty much. Uh, what we're finding is that uh, there's, there's a lot of groundswell of awareness from things on sustainability, from uh, people uh, hearing about global warming and reacting, uh, pesticides like Roundup making the news on a very regular basis, uh, the PFOA uh, contamination problems. All these things are, are, are I think, piquing the public's uh, attention. And we're really becoming a focal point in the area as an option for people to do what needs to be done and get the stuff that they have in their houses uh, out of them and doing it right. 
And like I said, the, the, the good news on that is that it is being done right. The bad news is uh, it's killing our budget. And uh, R being the collective R of uh, all of our uh, resources. Our, our hazardous waste contractor that we've been using for the uh, past two cycles uh, decided that they weren't going to operate in Vermont any longer. And uh, us and four other uh, communities uh, were then forced to go out and find an alternative. I put out an RFQ to uh, four different companies and I got one response that was viable. And that one response uh, made me very aware that it was not going to be cheaper than the company that we had had for the last two, three uh, year cycles. John, a little bit closer to the mic, please. Sure. Can you give us an idea of how much percentage was more expensive than this might be? Uh, yeah, I was just going to do that. Uh, it turned out I, I had budgeted about $26,000 for our two events, which was about 15% more than what I had budgeted the year before, and it turned out to be in the order of 40% more. And uh, that was a piece of the entirety of the, uh, the uh, budget uh, expansion, as, as it were, but it, on top of that, with the higher participation rate, uh, we also were blessed with somebody brought in something that had PCBs in it, and it was placed in a drum of oil. <clears throat> and where our normal drum of oil cost $67 to dispose of it, it was $1,327 to get rid of it. And uh, so you see how things escalate very quickly. Uh, we also, uh, like I said, had to hire a sheriff. Uh, we get reimbursed uh, for pesticides through the Agency of Agriculture, and they've been very good up until this summer. And they're still very good, but financially, uh, they've put constraints on all of the solid waste alliances, districts, and municipalities uh, because they've got budget issues. And as a result of that, where we were getting uh, about $8,000 plus for reimbursement of our hazardous waste uh, that was pesticide derived, we're now limited to $5,000 and it's a four year contract. So we know what we've got available and we're going to go uh, as a group, solid waste group, uh, to the legislature to try and get this modified because on top of the fact that we can't get reimbursed for anything beyond that, uh, there is a piece of legislation that says if people bring pesticides to our event, uh, we have to accept it without charging them for it. So, you know, no good deeds going unpunished. And so we, uh, we have to deal with that. And pesticides are several hundred dollars per drum for proper disposal. And never am I going to tell somebody, we're not gonna take this because we have to do the right thing and we will continue to do that. But this is just all part of the uh, problem that we're confronting and uh, trying to do this in the manner that's, uh, you know, keeping us sustainable. So, John, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure. That barrel of oil that was contaminated, um, were you unaware of the fact till after? We, they were unaware of it until it till, came back till, to the... To the processing. Because when they bring the drums back, they then go to transfer into larger tankers and they sample them before they do it, uh, and that's where that one was found. So, uh, yeah, better than having it there at that point than having it later on. And unfortunately, and, and there are some 
basic tests that can be done, but okay. there are there are problems with you know you you've got a lot of stuff coming in. Oh yeah. And uh, this is the first time we've had that happen, and we've been doing this now since 1994. So I like to think that we've been pretty fortunate, and there's also a small chance that I will be able to get that one drum, the cost reimbursed through the, uh, the association that uh, is the solid waste managers around the state. We have a, 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 a contingency fund for extreme hazards, and this one certainly offers that from the financial side. As opposed to uh, testing it on site because of the problems that, you know, you got so much coming in, you're trying to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Is there a labeling process that, uh, you know, whoever brings it in, you could label them on the, that specific sample or barrel or whatever, yeah. so that... You're, you're invited to be one of our volunteers. Uh, no, it's, it's a really hectic time. I mean, you've yeah. got people coming in with five-gallon cans and one-gallon cans and jugs, and uh, they're trying to get the tables cleared so they can help the next person, and we're looking. I mean, I, I, I love our volunteers because they're trying to facilitate making the, 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 the line go so people will get their stuff through and be able to be on their way and uh, not have the, the line back on to Route 100 as best we can. And we have, this year, after the spring event, we have redone the diagram of how people are bringing their stuff through the parking lots. It's definitely a better situation than, than it was, but it's hard to be able to sample everything uh, to that extent. Is, could there be a labeling requirement that if you want to turn something like this, you got to have, you know, your your label there on it? I, I, I think I'm just looking for yeah, ways to try that, to prevent this from happening. For the homeowner, I think that would be pretty impossible. Hmm. And and the, the, the question is, uh, how did it happen? Right. I mean, there there is, you know, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, are associated with transformers, and they're associated with uh, you know, kind of protecting uh, different electrical equipment, and they're supposed to be able to deal with high temperatures, and not a lot of people have them, but somewhere it was there. Yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, people wind up having stuff in a barn that they don't really know what it is, but it, they buy the barn and it's there, mm -hmm. and it just kind of becomes a... Uh, an attractive nuisance that has to go away. And uh, that's just part of what we deal with. We do, the, the folks do do some very rudimentary testing, you know, for pH and for chlorine and uh, a few other things, but there isn't uh, something to that degree until you're getting it sorted out down at the transfer yeah. facility, in this case in New Hampshire. Um, we also, in this world of uh, trying to keep our budgets going as best we can, uh, the town of Roxbury has indicated that they are going to stay on their side of the mountain and they're going to join up with the Mountain Alliance. But we don't know when because they have to have a vote by every one of the towns in that organization to welcome them in. And so we expect to have a partial year of their participation and then they'll go away. And the solid waste implementation plan grant that we get from the state, which we use entirely on the household hazardous <coughs> waste, uh, should be safe for this year. But next year I'm going to be looking at about a $1,000 loss in that plus the uh, the, the town's uh, per capita of, you know, donation, if you will. So those are things that are, are coming. Those are the major things 
the Agricultural Department, and the town of Roxbury. Uh, other stuff that's going on, and I'll be quick. I, I know it doesn't sound like it, but I'll try to be quick. Uh, I, I just want to give you a couple of highlights, because it really is, uh, I think, something to be proud of. We, we collected over 15 tons of tires, both with Greenup and with the folks bringing their tires in in the spring, and then Wheels for Warmth, we had a roll-off uh, over at uh, well, down at Hannon Home Center in the fall, and we had a, it was like a 20-yard roll-off as well. So we did a lot of collecting of, of that. We collected over a ton of uh, scrap metal during Greenup Day. Uh, between the volunteers here in Waterbury and the volunteers down in the valley. Uh, I helped uh, two pretty well attended uh, composting uh, workshops here in the Alliance uh, and sold compost bins and green cones and uh, we talked about things that were coming because the universal Recycling Act, uh, which was passed in uh, 2012. Suddenly, the distant future of July 1st, 2020, when uh, suddenly our uh, food scraps at residential levels were to be diverted is here. And suddenly there's an awareness on the part of the public that, is it really this year? And uh, Every, every newsletter I try to uh, remind people that this is coming. And the important thing to recognize is that food scraps to the state's desire does not include meat, does not include fish, does not include fats and greases and stuff like that. That can still go in the trash so people don't have to worry if they've got a backyard compost bin that the bears are going to be attracted, or the coyotes, or whatever, to that. Of course, they can be attracted to the recycling that you put out in your garage while you're waiting to bring it to the transfer. Station. So what was the underlining reasoning for excluding those types of things from? Uh, primarily because, because they of that. are a, well, a couple of things. They, as they're breaking down, you could wind up with vectors, fat maggots, and things like that but they also definitely attract more of the, uh, the wildlife uh, to come in. Even though we talk about how to minimize the odoriferous emanations by making sure you have as much carbon as a uh, impact uh, material over that. But uh, old Smokey the Bear is a growler and a howler and he sniffs the air. And uh, it's not just for fires, he's pretty good at uh, detecting stuff. But uh, I, I expect Bill probably gave a presentation on composting <laughs> after he took the class uh, to all of the folks here. I took it too. That's right, that's right. Yeah, well, we were in it together. You guys probably, uh, yeah, yeah, pass, compare notes. Um, so, so that's the other thing. The other thing that uh, has happened is that the single-use uh, products law uh, has passed and uh, plastic bags for taking your uh, groceries home are going to be one of those memories that will fade away. And the Waterbury Rotary Club is selling those bags over there as a replacement for those single-use bags and uh, uh, they, they work very well. Uh, also, straws, stirrers, and styrofoam uh, clamshells are going to be a thing of the past here in, here in Vermont. So hopefully we won't see too many uh, ocean-going turtles with uh, stirrers stuck in their noses and uh, any fish with uh, bags wrapped around them. And the uh, Lake Champlain <coughs> gyre will not exist like it does in the Pacific Ocean. I think we're doing the right thing. I think it's got to be done thoughtfully. I think uh, uh, there's still more to accomplish. 
And uh, it's all going to be a matter of time and money. And uh, as long as we're careful with how we proceed, it should work. Uh, all that being said, and I'll get to the end of my soliloquy, uh, our budget has to go up to deal with the cost that we're uh, confronting. The, I put in a proposed per capita of seven dollars, up from six twenty-five, and uh, that's meeting the budget, and it should meet the budget with Roxbury uh, even coming out. Uh, what it does do though, and I'm not, you know, uh, we don't have a lot, there's no fat in this budget. But what there is, is my hours are going to have to go down uh, because my board asked me to get a raise this year and so they agreed to a 3% raise, which is the first one since 2013. Uh, but at the same time, I've dropped 20% of my hours to be able to make the budget fit. It's like uh, being damned with faint praise. <laughs> but there's, there's, this is not health care. This is not education. But it's important. And uh, we need to make it work. And I'm willing to continue to do that. Is that why education uh, costs or less for 2020? Well, the education costs really aren't less. They're just put in different places. And uh, we used what we, uh, what we had there. Uh, a lot of it went into uh, my hours in terms of yeah. what I was doing. So. So even though you show an increase, unless I'm mistaken here, you're, gener you're anticipating generating, generating a little less revenue. Uh, and then your expenditures are down a tad bit, too. So it looks yeah, like... Yeah, because... But that's because it's dropped his hours. Right, that's, that's, that's the reason of it. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, I have been the safety valve on this. I didn't, uh, all of my hours for this year aren't in my, uh, because we were going to be so tight. But it's, uh, it is what it is. Well, I hope it doesn't get to a point where cutting your hours too much jeopardizes the quality of the, the program. It's uh, not going to. Uh, okay. I mean, I just, I, I will be doing the work as I do some of it now without getting paid. It's just, <laughs> It's just, uh, and I don't just do this for the money. No, I don't do this for the money. <laughs> Let's call a spade a spade. I do this because I enjoy doing it, and I think it's an important thing for the people of this area, as well as throughout the state, to do it and do it right. And if I can help, I want to continue to do that. So back to the quick question there with, with the loss of Roxbury, possible loss of Roxbury. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a hypothetical question. Would that, in a sense, just wash itself because you don't have that participation in, I mean, you lose a little bit of revenue, but you also... I, I, I wish that Roxbury was a more vital player, but there are 691 residents uh, were 1.9 percent of our participants in the hazardous waste collection uh, activities, and uh, they. I have asked on multiple occasions the representative from Roxbury to try and work with the town, you know, public works guy to have a dump truck bring stuff over to our collection, try and make it easier. And basically, uh, being on the other side of the mountain, right. it really makes sense for them. And uh, and they've got a sweetheart deal that I really, uh, I can't, I can't match. Beat. You can't match. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Y'all set then, John? Yeah. Uh, Any questions? 
Number one, you need to approve the budget, but number two, and more importantly, you gotta give me a decent representative to the board because I've been dealing with this guy over here. <laughs> and I wanna continue to deal with him. I, Joe, you got a question? Yeah, I do. Yeah. That button right on the top, just push down about halfway. See it? Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Push it in. Is it green? Yeah, I guess so. No. Just push in hard. You want to borrow this one? Just talk to him. Sorry. Great. Yeah. I just have one question. Sure. Coming from where I come from okay. for four years. Uh, you're talking PCPs. PCBs. Yeah, and they just show up in drums. Why isn't a state representative, you know, somebody from, you don't know what they're going to drop you off. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they could drop you off something and light it an hour later and you're standing there. This is not a friendly world we live in. But what I'm saying is, why is there not a state representative there? You know, somebody that deals with this stuff. Oh, the uh, people that are, the technicians that are with the company that takes the stuff are perfectly capable of... Safety handling. claim is who we're talking about? No, it's a company called Tradebi. But the point being is somebody, it's, I think, Chris, are these coming in labeled? There should be a label on that container before you guys even touch it. Well, you know, in, in a perfect world, I would totally oh, agree, I agree with you. I 100% agree with you, and, and, but and it's your safety, uh, and it's our safety that it's done right. Oh, yeah, and I, and I think that uh, for the most part, the stuff that comes in is adequately labeled, but there was a time when Harwood's bus garage used to accept used oil from uh, various locations. I used to work there. I know. And they wound up getting and freeze and everything else yeah. and the oil. And and so we we like to think we are sensitive and aware of everything that comes in. Unfortunately, you uh, have that two percent that don't. Well, but I, I I think the biggest issue that we wind up confronting is the folks that have a garage, a house that they bought, or there's a barn and there's this container out there that's been there for God knows how long and they need to finally get rid of it. And we have no idea, they have no idea, what might have been in it. Right. And so that's my the dilemma. I don't mean to interrupt you, but my comment is you have one of those 55-gallon drums the oh. person's name should be on that drum. Well, no, it's not. And if it is a chemical you can't deal with, they should be charged back for that. Well, the, number one, it's not a 55-gallon drum that they're bringing in. It's be, probably a one-gallon jug that looks like oil. And that's, I think, what was probably done. But how hard is it to label yeah. that container and... Yeah, he, I, I think he understands, Joe. Uh, I'm, sorry, I, I, I'm sure they're probably doing all they can do to to uh, mitigate that problem. I mean, but the, the homeowner your point, point's well taken. not be able to label it properly either. Well, um, unfortunately, the homeowner in, they don't in know. many cases doesn't have any idea yeah. right. what the material is. And I've gone over to, I've had people call me and, and I've gone over to their houses up. My, my husband died. I've got this stuff in the shed, and I'm really concerned. And I've gone in there, and it's a bunch of stuff, and I've taken it and brought it to the collection. But don't tell people. <laughs> yeah, could be a, could be a number of thinners and oil and all kinds of stuff good. just mixed together. Yeah. Okay, John. Okay. Appreciate your time. Uh, him. Alec. We need him. Oh, so, so do we need to approve? Uh, do we do that in after town meeting? Uh, probably. Yeah, we do all the appointments after town meeting. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So you're good for now. Sure. Well, I don't know. Do we need that. to approve the budget? <laughs> no. Well, the, so 
No, you don't have to approve the budget. Mm -hmm. the, we have been told that the per capita fee is going to be seven dollars per capita. Mm -hmm. I'll put that in the budget, and then we'll deal with it when the time comes. So. Yep. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thanks again. Is there a reason to ask Alec if you need to? Yeah, he might have some. Alec, you got any, anything you'd like to add here before you guys take off? I didn't. No, no. He does a tremendous amount of work for uh, no pay. Um, the board forced him to put his budget at three percent raise. As they say, he hadn't got it since thirteen. Yeah. And then he had to cut his hours. So <laughs> kind of a double-edged sword there. But I think between now and July first, we're going to do our best to uh, make people aware of the options to deal with their food waste. Yeah. Yeah, things are coming. So you're gonna be selling the compost bins and the green cones again? Yeah, but we're gonna triple the price. <laughs> Just for me. <laughs> no, we are we are gonna sell them. Uh, I have to get them out of the uh, old armory. Okay. Yeah, if you need any I do I am gonna need a couple of green cones, I think. Uh, I have one and I think I need two more. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again. Thanks. 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 Okay, Bill. So uh, all your game from here on out. So we have uh, A through D under my uh, items here, and if it's all right with you, I would request that we put item C on now, and we can deal with Nick, and then let him go home instead of sitting here for another half an hour or whatever it takes. So, you look like he's enjoying Nick, himself. Nick said not fun doing anything. How you doing, Nick? Good. Get this on. So, uh, as I indicated in the memo that I sent out, um, 2019 I think was a successful year for the recreation department. Um, I'll let Nick fill in the blanks. Uh, you know, I think participation in many of the programs that we uh, generate fees with uh, are higher than they have been. Uh, we reestablished the middle school program for the first time since way back in the, probably the late 90s. Um, they, they were over at the Wesley Methodist Church. Uh, revenue in all instances, all the revenues that we collect were higher than they have been in the past. They were all higher, well, in aggregate, they were higher than the budget. There were a few of them that were lower than the budget, but those were mainly mini camps. And as I've told you many times, uh, if mini camp revenues are only, you know, 5,000 out of an $8,000 budget, well, that means we spent less to run those programs too. It's really a, a program that, that only runs if there's particip participation, and if there's no participation, we have no cost. So with that little brief introduction, I'll turn it over to Nick, um, and then we can get into the budget, too. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so this summer was pretty successful for the rec department and all the programs we ran. Um, day camp sold out in 19 minutes for the full camp, uh, which is shattered the previous impressive record of like four hours. So, um, and that was with opening up the extra spots for uh, fourth through seventh grade in addition to kindergarten through third grade. Uh, we ran uh, a, a variety of different mini camps, so week only camps. Um, a mini camp could also be like a one day camp. So uh, we ran a lot of science camps uh, out of CrossFit Brook and, uh, and like science engineering sort of deal. And then we ran, uh, we started like a new basketball camp uh, called Central Vermont Hoop Camp. And uh, the first year we had 18 kids, so that was pretty successful. Um, next year it should only grow, or this summer should only grow because the word is out. And, um, the instructor we have is pretty good for it. Was that run out of the school too? Yeah, Cross yeah. the Brook, yeah. Uh, we had to be flex, like pretty creative on the hours because Cross the Brook's gym is really booked in the summer, surprisingly. 
Um, so it was a half day camp. Um, we're hoping to make it a full day camp this year. Um, so, yeah. Excuse me. Um, while we're on the mini camp subject, uh, looking here at the uh, previous budget for 19 and then the proposed, um, it looks like you're what, what you actually uh, had for 2019 versus what was budgeted was down substantially. Is there a, is there a decrease in interest in? Are you talking about expenditures or revenue? Uh, expenditures. Um, we just ran it pretty efficiently. Um, we had probably, I have it right here. We had four, 3,000 less than what we, 3,000 and change we had less projected in revenue for it, but as Bill said, if we spend less, if we make less, we spend less, so. Okay. Yeah, there's, so in the rec program budget, there's two lines for expenditures that say mini camp. There's regular pay mini camp at the top of the page where we budgeted 6,000 and we spent 3,900. And then down towards the bottom of the page, there's another line item for mini camps. We budgeted 53 and spent 48.26. So maybe you can explain why there's two lines. Okay, yeah, so one is for pay. So we would pay uh, instructors or staff that run it. Um, mini camp also includes, like I said, day, day only camp. So we did, a, like new this year, two overnights at Little River State Park, introduced kids to camping. Um, so we pay staff out of that line, but we'll pay for materials out of the mini camp line. Um, so supplies for some of the other camps were, were paid out of the mini camp line. Um, for Fees, I assume, to the campground. Right, right. Yep. Right. Yep. And and the last couple of years, Chris, um, you know, the mini camp line has traditionally, as long as we've run mini camps, we budget a higher level. We seem to spend a little less. We take in a little less revenue. It's it's pretty normal. Yeah, I was just, I was, you know, even on the uh, revenue chart here, you're. You're down, you know, you, you budgeted 15, you're down 11. Actually, pulled in 11.2, and then you budgeted for 2020, 12,000. So I just, I, you yeah, know, it just threw up a flag for me saying, yeah. that, is there a lack of interest there or no. declining lack of interest? So it doesn't sound like there is. No, that's I, good. I think it's increased. It, the, mini, it, the revenue from mini camps has increased by 3,000 since 2018. So okay. this in the year, it's increasing. Good. Um, yeah, so that for some programming is pretty successful. The pool, um, I think we made eight thousand more dollars than what was projected for revenue. Um, and, um, we stayed, stayed in our budget for it um, for the most part. Uh, there was no major issues at the pool. Um, the feedback from the new renovations that we did for adding the family changing room, the new toilets, the, the updated checking system, we had a lot of positive feedback on that. The, the uh, if you include the um, revenue that we received and the expenses for the lifeguard training and stuff like that, we actually were ninety nine seventy to the good on the pool. We took nine thousand nine hundred seventy dollars more in revenue than um, than we thought. About eight thousand dollars just on the pool memberships right. and then the balance on the lifeguard stuff. Um, that also includes the off-season swim lessons, but um, right. that, yeah, they're doing very well. So. Um, yeah, outside of the pool, I don't, um, I don't have anything else on the pool. It was successful. A lot of good feedback. Um, yeah, rec camps were really well. It's just, they went really well this summer. It was really busy. Um, we tried some new things. We did the training for trauma-informed care. So our staff uh, had both lifeguards and camp counselors take it uh, just so they knew how to handle situations with uh, children if, if issues arise. Um, and subsequently, we didn't kick anyone out of camp this summer. Um, we had some sent homes, but it was very much parents were on included in the discussion. And you know there might be a few that didn't agree, but we're like, OK, we'll just we understand. Um, so, so, the, so the training <clears throat> paid off in a sense. Training paid off, and and that just kind of restructured our behavioral system all together. So it's, it, mm -hmm. it sets children up a little bit better for for success versus 
and we plan to do that again this year, yes. right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. As long as the, come the agency we partnered with, we were a pilot program. They did me a favor mm -hmm. um, by doing, they've never done it before for anyone. So they're going to, I'll work with them to see if we'll do it again. If not, I can bring in other people to do it, so. Um, so how many uh, enrollees did you have in the middle school camp? This was the first year that we yeah. run that? Uh, 37. Mm -hmm. We're registered this summer for the, the middle school camp for the eight week session. And then um, we opened up five slots a week. Your grandson took advantage of that new feature. Um, so we, uh, I don't have the numbers from that, but you can add a few more for the middle school camp. As but the middle school, um, the expectation is that that will continue to grow, right? It should, yeah. Kids who have younger siblings that are going to graduate out of the elementary school camp will move up yep. potentially. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot more awareness about it now that it's started up, whereas kids halfway through the summer in town were like, oh, I didn't know I could go to rec again. So, um, yeah, hopefully it makes sense that it would grow. Um, and the, only the middle school is at Cross at Brook, the younger kids don't go to Cross at The Brooke. middle school is at the uh, Wesley Methodist oh, that's Church, right. yeah, the, the church in right. town in the basement. Um, okay. But we use that mostly as like a, a drop-in, like drop-off, pick-up, and thunder shelter. Um, they did everything else out here. Okay. It wasn't raining. Yeah. What's the relationship with the Senior Citizen Center and the meal program, and how, how do we participate? How many participate? Yeah, so uh, just like in school, the free lunch program, they do it in the summer, the Vermont, or not, the, the Agricultural Department, I think, right? I think that's what offers it. Um, we utilize the senior center. They get reimbursed for every kid that needs, like, that qualifies for the lunch in, in the summer. They can't really uh, determine who qualifies. So any kid under 18 qualifies for their lunch program, they'll get reimbursed for it. Um, so we send probably on average 60 to 70 kids um, just from our camp to the senior center every day during the summer for lunch. Um, senior center did a great job accommodating us and. It gets pretty crazy when they have that many kids in a building that size um, with older folks that are trying to enjoy their meal. Um, <laughs> so, um, but overall went well. Uh, senior Center had good feedback. So um, that's our relationship with the Senior Center in order to make sure that our kids are, are fed. And the that's balance great. of your kids bring their own lunch or something? Or what was that? The balance of the yeah. kids yeah. bring their own lunch? Yeah. Would you say it's like 25% or something? Go to the, get free lunch? Uh, more well, well, like 65 or 75%. Oh. Yeah. I mean, if I was a, if I was a kid, knowing probably what I know, I, I'd want to eat at the senior center every day. <laughs> <laughs> the heck with bringing my own lunch. <laughs> like parents think the same thing. Yeah. 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 Free lunch. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, outside of uh, summer, um, the off-season programming has been successful. We, um, in the beginning of the year, we offered some adult ukulele classes that filled up. Um, I took the first one uh, just because I wasn't sure if we were going to hit registration numbers, and we ended up having <laughs> the max. So I sat in here and learned how to put the ukulele. It was fun. Um, and we did some women's self-defense courses. Uh, we tried to partner with um, Rebound Dojo to do some karate, uh, intro to karate for children and adults. Um, we offered off-season, in addition to off-season, some lessons at First and Fitness. We offered uh, life off-season lifeguard courses uh, that is um, in part trying to solicit new guards for the summer, um, but the need's out there and we're kind of the Red Cross hub, so um, organizations work through us to get their, their, um, their staff trained. And just so you know, that getting lifeguards is a continuing challenge. I think it's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, what, what that means is we have to pay more. Um, there's not as many young people who are um, taking the lifeguard course. That's why we offer it, to try to stimulate some interest in it. Um, there's a lot of competition. There's the swimming hole up in Stowe. Uh, I think they pay more than we do. Uh, then you've got Barry and and Montpelier, who have swimming pools in the summer. Uh, there's other places. So it's a challenge. Um, and, you know, the, we've budgeted 
$51,000 for regular pay in 2020, which is just slightly more than we spent last year. Um, minimum wage is going up. Um, and, and, you know, Nick and I talked about it a little bit. And I feel that um, we'll stick with that budget number. Um, and hopefully, if we end up having to spend more for lifeguards, that it will be offset by additional revenue. So, you know, we, we're marketing the program. As I said in my narrative, um, swimming pool revenue for us is very dependent upon the weather. If you have a really cool and rainy early part of the summer, it really dampens the uh, interest in the pool. It's an eight-week program, and if it's, you know, 63 degrees until the 4th of July, um, you kind of, there's no big pent-up demand to go swimming. So uh, it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. The, the minimum wage is going up to what? Uh, 1098. And it was? 1078 or 1076. So it's going up about 20, 25 cents a year right now. Um, and, and that does impact us because we, we do, we are an entry level um, employer for many of the young people in the community. They come in to be either lifeguards or um, camp counselors and usually they're started off at that minimum wage and, and that's going up a little bit as well. But uh, I think the budget is reasonable. Uh, I think there's, a, a, you know, we tried to keep the budget on the expenditure side as close to the bone as we could. There were things that Nick had proposed to me, we talked about, we ended up lowering the budgets a little bit, um, and understanding that sometimes we go over budget, we're hoping if we go over budget, there's offsetting revenue. So um, we, we took in more in recreation fees last year than we anticipated. Um, so because of that, because that's been a little bit of a trend lately, I think that I'm not being as conservative as I have in the past with the revenue side of the budget. So if you look at the fourth page there of the, of, uh, of Oh yeah, the back page. Um, you know, you see last year for programs, we budgeted 80,000. We took in 93.8. I've actually proposed 95 this year. I'm hoping that if the middle school program grows a little bit uh, and with fee increases that Nick will talk about in a second, that we can maybe get that 95 number. The mini camp went down, but you know, we're, we're budgeting not quite as much as we took in in, in 19, um, but we are budgeting for donations this year where we didn't budget for that last year. So being a little bit more aggressive with the budget side of, I mean, with the revenue side of the budget. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry, not? just a couple quick questions here. Um, computer service was up substantially and the advertising record, is that because you're just trying to be more aggressive about uh, advertising? or is The advertising is specifically for job postings. So as Bill said, we have a lifeguard shortage. Uh, last year I had a lot of turnover um, I inherited from the previous year. So I had to uh, put a lot more ads in the paper and on social media and different channels in order to, to try to fill out the roles. In addition, we started a new camp, so I, I have more staff I needed anyways, so. Um. On, on the computer services, um, the $2,895 that we spent in 2019 is the fee that we have to pay for the MyREC program, I believe, isn't that correct? Our registration program. So we didn't spend anything else last year, and uh, you know, Nick, um, he has a computer that we, we provide, but he also has his own laptop, and there's programs on that that um, we both use. We should pay for some of that. Uh, so it's a it's a more fair budget. We, if you look at 
probably what we spent this year without reimbursing uh, for some of the things that we that we that were purchased on our behalf. It would have been a little bit higher. That my rec program, though, um, I think definitely is worth its uh, 100%. Yeah, worth its. Um, Existence, you know, Deb found that program for us, uh, and um, you know, just by virtue of the number of uh, journal entries I have to approve, which indicate that we're getting cash from somebody's credit card that the bookkeeper needs me to sign off on before she can post it. Uh, we get a lot of revenue. People love to be the ability to sign up for rec programs on the on the computer using this program and. Uh, it's really, you know, the, the $2,800 that we spend. Um, well, it saves a main, lot of time. One of the main reasons why right. the revenue has driven up so high. Right, because it saves time processing all that paperwork, too. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and I see a, an increase in the rec director's pay line. Um, yeah, so the overtime and, and increase in pay as well yeah so the the pay last year um i i did not factor any overtime i thought i factored some overtime into last year's budget and when i looked the other day the 43 425 was simply um nick's pay for 52 weeks a year at 40 hours and uh, he worked overtime. The, 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 it was a mistake on my part not to budget any overtime for 2019. Uh, the 52,776. Um, I forgot how many overtime hours that you worked, but 248. He and I, he and I talked, and the number of overtime hours that are budgeted this year is significantly lower than that. Um, Nick told me the other day that I evidently had indicated that uh, maybe he was overwhelmed with some things last year. And he said, I wasn't overwhelmed. It's just that you didn't budget for any time for me. And uh, there were a number of new programs that he had to run. So how many hours did we budget this year for overtime? Uh, well, like 142. Yeah. So it's significantly fewer hours than last year. I am proposing uh, uh, higher than inflationary pay increase for him. I think he's done a good job and uh, and I think he deserves that. So that's why the 50,525, I mean 520 is there. So. Mm -hmm. And the only other question I had um, on the workman's comp line items almost in every, every Everybody. place I look there. Um, does it seem a little bit excessive to you? I mean, it no. seems that they, they, it seems like they roller coaster. Um, well, uh, they often do. Unfortunately for us, the roller coaster is still being pulled up by that chain up the first hill. It's continuing to go up higher every year. Uh, the town, uh, the last several years, has had pretty poor experience with uh, workers' comp claims. Uh, we've had a number of people, uh, not just in the highway department, we had a librarian last year that, that lifted a box and ended up with a fairly severe injury. Um, we've had a number of out of, not only medical claims for workers' comp, but lost time. So eventually you pay your claims. So our, you know, you get a, you get a bill and there's a rate for your workers' comp, uh, and it's the, the, the workers' comp rate for Carla and me is like 44 cents per 100, uh, 100. Uh, but for a highway worker, it's, you know, $9.57 per 100. For a librarian, it's $4 or something. For the rec department, it's $6 or whatever the seven. case may be, seven. Um, so, you know, but our, um, then they apply a modification factor, and a, a modification factor of one means that you're average with the rest of the group out there. So we, we get our workers' compensation through Vermont League of Cities and Towns. So if we had a one for a mod factor, that means we'd, that our claims history was average. If you got a 0.85, that means you're, you know, 15% better than average. Our mod factor, I think, is 1.6 right now. So we're 60% oh, 
worse than average of late. So yeah, it's gone up. Um, fortunately, it's, it's not as big of a price, but the workers' compensation rates, I mean, the uh, unemployment rates went way down. So you'll, when you look through the rest of the budget, you'll see some savings there. Right. But yeah, the workers' comp, uh, we've had some bad experience. And uh, uh, hopefully we've seen the last of that for a while. But it takes, it takes a few years to, you know, of good experience to run out your bad experience. Of course, of course. Um, and I, I see on your um, recreation program rental fees, really nothing's changed other than the daily group rate. Um, what are you looking at, Chris? The, the, okay. the yeah. things that Nick handed out. Um, so I, I asked Nick on uh, Thursday, I think last week, uh, whether we were doing anything with fees, and he said, well, no, we just, we just adjusted fees last year. Thought about it a little bit, and, you know, started talking about the, the full eight-week camp, um, and, you know, for residents, we're not even charging $100 a week, and even with, with the proposal here, we're still not charging $100 a week. So I asked him to look at uh, rates that he administers, that he ends up collecting and telling folks that these are our rates. This is what he gave me this afternoon. I haven't had a chance to really look at it. So if you have any questions, you should ask. Um, your rationale for increasing the summer camps and the like by 25 or $50, whatever they are, so. Yeah. Uh the as Bill said, the eight-week camps are uh, last year wasn't even a hundred, even for non-residents wasn't a hundred dollars a week. Um, in comparison, child care is uh, if you hire a babysitter for the nine hours that we provide child care in the summer, um, you'll pay at like ten dollars an hour. You'll pay that babysitter the same you'd pay a child that would be in that camp for that week. Um, so we're substantially less. And then you look at other programs. The YMCA runs a camp out of Thatcher Brook. Um, they charge a couple hundred, a little over a couple hundred a week, um, and they do per week uh, sessions. So, uh, any comparable area um, camp where we come in under, and we provide a lot, I think, for what um, what we do. Uh, so, but at the same point, point, the reason we sell out in 19 minutes is because of we're keeping it affordable. Um, so when Bill and I talked, uh, I had already we'd already raised it uh, about. $50 last year, or $25 and $50. Um, but it made sense to raise it, uh, residents 25 and um, non-residents by 50, uh, just to offset the cost of minimum wage going up. Um, our busing uh, potentially could get more expensive. Um, and so it just, the, just other things happening too. Um, it makes sense. Um, then we have week only sessions and um, those I've requested to be increased 25 each. It, it, again, it, it keeps it, you know, $200 or less per week just for the week only stuff, so which is um, comparable or, or cheaper than to, to childcare in the area. So I think Chris's question, and I don't mean to put um, words in his mouth, but there's a whole lot of no changes on the page. Yeah. There's only a few rates that are increasing the camp rates and the daily group rates for the pool are going up, but everything else is no change, and why Why that? Oh, okay, yeah, so the facility rentals where you approved a three-year fee structure uh, in 2017, mm -hmm. um, we're at a spot where that, where 2019's fees shouldn't go up in other years. In a year or two, we'll have a conversation about that, but for now, they're comparable um, to other uh, areas, facilities like that we have here in other areas. Um, I just put this on solely so you had an idea of what we were charging. Mm -hmm. um, for the, the programs that have no change, um, I, same, same thing. Uh, we're, would make sense to charge more than $100, for instance, for a resident, for our family pool, uh, for a family, for the pool, um, for a membership uh, this year. But in the future, maybe we will get it going up. But they're, they recently were changed before I come in, so they're not, they're not anything that... Um, to increase yet. Yeah, I would recommend not increasing yet. You know, I'm looking at the uh, 
the summer camp fees. Um, and I just, it brings to mind my, what my son has to pay for daycare for one child for a week is $320, which is staggering. Um, so I guess my, my sole concern here, and I knew that kind of the reason that these uh, fees hadn't budged much is because we kind of had set a, a set of fees for a couple of years here before we decided to start making any increases, but I just want to um, make sure that we don't somehow start to fall behind um, in keeping with the inflation costs of, you know, operations here. So, yeah, uh, that, and that, still yeah. try to offer as, as affordable, and I know that you're probably on top of all of that. So. I think we're doing that. I think our, the total uh, burden on the taxpayers is 2% less than it was last year. Uh, projected so uh, we're definitely keeping up if not doing better yep no it's uh, you're doing a good job thank you appreciate, appreciate it that. yeah I want to say um, I, I'm really impressed I know you um, took on a lot we know with the transition from Deb she had set the path to turn these programs around and turn them into um, look for ways to make money and that were pra pragmatic like the training of, at the pool made a lot of sense because you're training people that, that can come to our pool too um, for swim, swimming lessons and everything. Um, but these other programs, I think the mini camps and the middle school, the tapping that population is really important. So I just feel like the whole, um, I think you've done a great job and I feel like the whole vibe of this is, is really positive and um, so much uh, I just think it's very responsive to our town with the, the my rec and everything, people being able to sign up so quickly and easily. So good job. Yeah. Uh, the one other question I had, um, you spoke of uh, lifeguard rates, uh, pay rates, yeah. and how they compare some of these other towns. How do they compare? Uh, <clears throat> are we like way off or? We're, we're way off. Uh, for instance, the swimming hole will pay $15 an hour for a lifeguard, and we pay as low as minimum wage. Um, I guess a comparable guard, um, we had some experience once apply midway through the summer, because uh, I had to recruit throughout the summer, because we were still kind of short. Um, we would have to, like the most we could offer someone would be like twelve fifty or $13 an hour, um, and that would be them. Yet, being sold on my charisma and the director <laughs> and being like, all right, they seem like they'd be okay to work for. Like, I guess I'll work for that one. Um, but yeah, that's, we're, we're off, but. Is I, that something we can so work, work on next year? It's like, just, it's, it's going to be a higher pay line, and really? there's only so much money you can get out of yeah. a uh, seasonal pool that's outdoors. So. Right. right. Hence my concern about the, uh, I won't, the great affordable uh, yeah. summer camp costs and maybe at some point you have to take a look at balancing or you know increasing that a little bit in order to offset some of that so. yeah to, yeah. to attract more it's a balancing more, act right, and we're absolutely and, we're trying. and um, you know we'll uh, that's why i wanted to bring it to your attention because you know we are off a little bit there are some people that just you know they like to have a outdoor job in their own town as opposed to, you know, sitting up inside. But, you know, at some point if it's three or four dollars an hour difference, yeah. you decide to, you know, sit inside in, in a stuffy pool as opposed to outside on it. I mean, if it becomes problematic that we're starting to have a tough time, yeah. then then I guess we need to right. and look at it. Yeah. You know, I need to yeah, deal with it. Exactly. Yeah. But we're good. We're getting creative for trying. So. Good. I would thank you for a um, very nice presentation tonight. And um, all of the feedback that I have heard throughout the town has been awesome. Uh, there's a lot of super psyched kids out there. Yeah, I think it's great we can offer these programs to the kids. I think you're off the hook, Nick. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Okay, uh, the zoning compliance letter.
Um, I think I did a fair job uh, in my narrative. Um, if you read that, there's only a compliance letter is something that we've been uh, writing or issuing for a number of years now. Um, it seemed like a good idea when uh, when the select board was asked to do it. I don't frankly remember when that was. Um, my guess is it might have happened around the flood time and I, I really wasn't paying much attention to it at the time. Um, but as I said, uh, the problem with these letters is, uh, A, it requires a lot of staff time to go in and, and research, and B, even if you do all the research, you might still get something wrong. And, you know, somebody who's uh, wanting to develop a property, um, you know, they should be paying the costs for uh, figuring out whether they need permits or whether they have permits. Um, as I indicated, we did run this by our uh, municipal attorney, and they said, yeah, it's probably a better idea uh, if you don't require them to be issued. Uh, they brought up the fact that uh, the zoning administrator's uh, duties are pretty narrowly defined in the statute. There's no discussion of these letters, so um, I don't think anybody would probably take you to court over it. but. There is question whether there's even the authority to issue these letters on behalf, you know, on the zoning administrator's part. So Dina would like not to have to deal with these letters anymore, and uh, um, I think that it has taken, a, I won't say an inordinate amount of her time, but she spends, she has spent a fair amount of time on this issue and if she doesn't have to do it, there's other things that she can be more productive with. So since the select board was the board that directed the zoning administrator to issue them, it needs to be the select board that says they're no longer authorized to be issued. So this is, this is not the letter that comes with your zoning, no, no, no. zoning Z that you get in the mail. No, this, this is, is a, a letter that says, uh, Dear Mr. Fish, you asked whether, you know, all the permits necessary for what's at your property now are in, in order, and they are. And it, if it turns out they're not, then you might be mad and say, hey, you told me I had everything I needed. I, and yeah. I, so it's not the, the letter that you get with your zoning permit. I, I was just double checking that because I do remember <coughs> seeing copies of this letter when it was on the DRB, and I thought it was... Uh, kind of sticking our necks out. Yeah, it really is. So. Do other towns that we know of <clears throat> go to the extent of issuing these letters? I think they do. Um, I, but the ones I, with the bigger staff. But I think that budgets. there's a movement towards Getting moving free. away from them again. Yeah. Like I said, it's it was one of these things I, I believe, and I'm not an expert on it, but mm -hmm. I think it came up as hey, this is a service that the public wants. They want us to tell us everything is in order. Yeah. But once you do that, and if you make a mistake, then you've yeah. made an enemy there. And if you make a different mistake, there's other people that might be upset. So. I mean, people can always come in and make an appointment and go yeah, over Yeah, they can come in. They can Dean. look through the files and, and you know, they can figure out. And talk to staff. And, yeah. yeah. So okay. I, I'm, and he, have you spoken to our attorney about that? Yeah, we've, we've asked our attorney if we should be issuing these, and they said it's probably better that you don't. So there's no current guidelines or any, any uh, laws that state that the zoning administrator has to, has to sign off on this. So no, if, if, it's if somebody was having a closing, right. a lawyer wouldn't it's, say, where's the... No, it's the contrary. No, That's okay. it's the opposite yeah. of that. Okay. So, so do we need to make a recommendation? Yeah, I would make a motion. I would ask one of you to make a motion to uh, cease the uh, that the zoning administrator uh, uh, cease the uh, issuance. issuance of zoning compliance letters. I, I would make a motion that we uh, that we discontinue, discontinue the zoning compliance letter uh, by the zoning administrator. Yep. Okay. I would second that. Right. Any further discussion? Okay. All those who wish to approve that motion, say aye. 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 aye.
Okay. Um, Duxbury Fire Contract, I sent that out. Um, as I said in the narrative, back on December 12th, I uh, did a preliminary contract for them, uh, based it on, um, I think, based it on $722,000 of, uh, of uh, $724,000 in spending. Um, and you can see that on this budget that I, if you still have that, I sent that out. Um, so I projected on, on December 12th that when we hit the end of the year, it would be 724,857. And if it's that amount, the contract would be $114,100. Uh, as of the 31st, we had spent about $722,000, but there'll always be some monies posted back. It will probably be slightly higher than the 724 that I projected. Um, and I, I actually went to a Duxbury Select Board meeting. They asked me to go over there. They were fearful that their um, contract price was going to go through the roof because of the fire truck purchases that we made. And I explained how we pay for our fire trucks out of the capital fund, and that we fund our capital fund out of the operating fund, and that the operating fund wasn't going to increase dramatically. So anyway, the Select Board was happy with this proposed contract. Um, as I said before, I said the same thing last year. My recommendation to you is to offer this contract to Duxbury at 114, 100, even if our year-end spending is slightly above 724, 857. Uh, you know, if it was 745, like our budget was last year, the contract price would be about 117 thousand dollars, and I think it's better to keep happy. Uh, neighbors that are willing to pay 114 as opposed to uh, you know trying to get every last penny out of the out of the agreement so and that's only a hundred dollars higher than last year's you said yeah last year um, it was actually a little bit higher than that we rounded it down to 114 this year I rounded it up a couple of bucks I think it was came out to 114. 028 or something like that when I did the math and uh, I did it up to 114. Yeah, you got it in here as uh, yeah, proposed 14, 14, 14 075 in, yeah. in the general fund. And they're, they're good. Well, right. the, the, the revenue in the general fund budget shows, um, excuse me, uh, shows 114,075 as opposed to 114,100 because the um, because this contract is runs from April 1st through March 31st. Back about five years ago, Bill Yacoboni said, "Well, um, you really can't credit all that revenue to the year that the contract that your budget is for." So he deferred essentially about twenty-five thousand dollars worth of the of the uh, of the revenue, and then every year I've got to make sure that and you don't have the balance sheet. I have to make sure that the balance sheet reflects that we've deferred uh, one quarter of the the payment, but that's already on the balance sheet. So I only have to adjust it by a few hundred dollars every year now. So that's why that number is slightly off. Okay. But Duxbury will pay us 114, 100 if you approve this cut. You know, assuming that their town meeting passes the budget. So, paragraph 10. Um, when I read that, I uh, was thinking about any scenario that, you know, if Duxbury voted not to agree and they were left with nothing yeah and a, a fire took place what would happen i mean we'd get called in as mutual aid uh or well are they sol yeah um <clears throat> neither so um <clears throat> 
Duxbury is not eligible to call any department through mutual aid because they don't have a fire department. So the way mutual aid works is if, if Waterbury goes up to the Wallace Farm on uh, Blush Hill, finds a fully involved structure, uh, we get on site with a fire truck and make an assessment and say, we can't handle this. No. So you call the mutual aid and you say, send Stowe and Middlesex to assist. So they tone out Stowe and Middlesex and they, they come. Um, if, Duck, if Waterbury goes to Duxbury and finds a fully involved uh, home, the same scenario would happen. If, if Moortown shows up over, you know, over by Harwood um, and for the section of Duxbury that they show and they find that they're fully involved, they can call mutual aid. If you don't have a fire department, you don't get to call mutual aid if nobody shows up at the fire. So what would happen, probably Waterbury would eventually go and then you'd have to negotiate with Duxbury how much you're going to pay for that call. But um, I, I'm not sure that we would, that the Waterbury Fire Department would simply not go. I mean, uh, especially given that there's been a contract in place for so long, uh, they would probably go um, just because somebody's life may depend upon it. Yeah, I didn't know if there was some state law that pertained, <laughs> pertained to negligence, whether a contract was yeah. there or not. I'm yeah. sure that, you know, uh, we would, well, I'm not a lawyer, but if, if there was no contract in place, in our fire department went. Uh, I think we would be covered, our liability would be covered um, if there was any issues, you know. I mean, anybody can sue anybody, right, or if something happened, but uh, our insurance would cover us. Um, I think Duxbury's select board is happy with this contract. There were a number of people at the, at the meeting, I think you were at the meeting. Um, there were a number of Duxbury residents at the meeting who I think had been ones at previous meetings who spouted off and wondered, you know, why do we have this contract with Waterbury? It's a lot of money. It's going to go through the roof. Um, I think Duxbury Select Board doesn't let people participate in the meeting as if it were a town meeting. They get to say their piece at the beginning of the meeting, and then they sit there and listen. Um, but I think everybody was satisfied with what um, my explanation was. The select board said that they would be bringing it to town meeting and uh, they would be recommending that it be funded as it has been for, you know, I'll get back to, uh, I think this contract form has been in place since about 2009. And did you say it was the same as last year? Essentially the One, same. $100 difference. $100 difference. And what did they do before 2009? They had a different contract with us. Okay. That but has it ever been voted down? No. So uh, the contract that that was in place before was more favorable to them. This this contract basically spreads the cost of our fire department over the grand lists of Waterbury and Duxbury. So they're paying essentially the same that you are now because a small portion of their town is covered by more town. Um, right. If you did the math, we still pay a little bit more here. But, you know, it's our department, so. Right, so I guess that was my question, uh, you know, along with anything. Um, as time goes on, and it, I think two years ago, we absorbed probably a little bit more than, I won't say than we should have, I mean, to make them happy. Um, and as time goes on, I want to just be cognizant of the fact that we keep, keep chiseling away at, at you know, what we're participating, what they should be. Uh, I wouldn't want to have too much of a disparity. No, I understand. And, they, and, and I told them that. And, you know, I, I did tell them at the meeting. I said, you know, my recommendation will be if we're within a few thousand dollars of what my projections are, I would just tell the board to leave it alone. If something happened right at the, you know, the last week of the year and we had a you know, let's say we had a, a truck that had $10,000 worth of damage that wasn't insurable and we weren't in the position of buying a new truck and we had to 
you know, spend that 10,000 bucks, we would adjust the contract. But what I try to do is, you know, they start their budget process a little earlier than we do, and they like, you know, they, they're starting in December. They're on a different, they have a July 1st year, so they're, they're on a different schedule than we are. And they like to have as much information as they can. So I try to give it to them and try to say, you know, if it's a minor amount, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it. Um, and I did, so I did tell them, and, and I said, and if for some reason it's, if the 722 that I projected is, uh, or 724 that I projected is, is uh, way too much and it should be less, you know, we'll adjust it for your sure. benefit too. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I, I think the difference between what I've done now and what I think we're going to end up at is just going to be very nominal and it's just as easy to say. We're all off of this. And you're feeling good about um, dispatching costs at this time? I mean, when does that information usually Oh, the dispatching costs are already known. They, they go up all the time. Right. Um, I don't have the fire budget here, but, uh, you know, this, and I, t I told them that. I mean, Mike was at the meeting. I said, you know, for, for those of you who, who think you might want to start your own fire department, I said, just <laughs> so you know, dispatching alone for our department is over $75,000. So that's where you start, you know, so yeah. anyway. Okay. I'm glad you went there. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like it was good for everybody. Yeah, it was just, I, from my perspective, it was worth, yeah. worthwhile. And they were nice to me, so yeah, good for you. So do we need to make them yeah, I would like to, to ask you to make a motion to to, it. to uh, uh, approve to approve a, a fire contract offering a contract to the town of Duxbury for one hundred fourteen thousand one hundred dollars for the period April one two thousand twenty three March thirty one two thousand twenty one. So moved. So second. It was easy. Seconded. Motion's been made and seconded to approve the Duxbury contract in town of Waterbury in Duxbury for the ensuing year of $114,100. <coughs> All those who wish to approve it, please say aye. 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 Okay. Um, general government budget. Um, so we'll, we'll quickly run through this. So the what I sent out on the paper that looks like this, that has the yellow highlight on the first page, uh, I'll run through the general fund uh, all together from a perspective of 2019. And then I'll quickly talk about revenues for 2020, which are general fund revenues. And then we can quickly talk about the general government department of the general fund. Uh, the proposed, my, my schedule right now is uh, next Monday we'll talk with uh, Gary Dillon about the fire department and we'll talk about um, the planning budget next Monday as well. Uh, and we've already done recreation and then two weeks from tonight uh, we'll talk about the highway budget. Uh, and the library commissioners will probably come in briefly that night. Um, right now, things are looking good. I haven't spent really any time yet on the highway budget, and that's the that's the biggest one. Mm -hmm. There's still things that, you know, in all of these budgets, there will be some additional um, expenditures posted back to 19, and there'll be a few uh, a few revenues posted back to 19. But I'd like the best information I can get to present the highway budget. So we'll wait until the, the 20th to do that. Um, you want me to keep going? You want me to wait for Jane? No, you probably should give her a second. All right. Unfortunate that the other two aren't here tonight as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's always too bad. Budgeting season should be 
all absorbed by all members. To yeah, well, I, I sent out the information to everybody, yeah. so you can at least read it. to miss anything, Jane, so we waited. Okay, so uh, the first page of the general fund budget and the general government department uh, is the general government revenue page. Uh, look, and it's all on that first page. So if you look at the bottom of the page, uh, we budgeted $2,921,270 of uh, all revenues, including property taxes. Uh, through the 31st, we've taken in uh, 2853000 which is uh, a little bit more than 97%, uh, $68,212 under budget. And when you look at the very top of the page, you can see we're 68000 under budget in total at the bottom, and at the very top, uh, we're under budget by 96248 on property taxes. So that means everything else, we're over what we expected. You got that? Yeah, I do. I, I had printed it out at home, but I missed a few lines on mine. <laughs> okay. Do you, have, uh, uh, do you have an extra? I don't, but you can look on with me. So anyway, um, through the end of the year, uh, we've collected um, all but ninety-six thousand dollars of the property taxes for the for the general fund alone, um, all together. And, and that ninety-six two forty-eight is the total delinquency of two thousand nineteen. The highway fund and the library fund get all of their tax money, and the general fund um, takes all of the all of the delinquencies uh, all together. And you don't have this on any of the papers that I sent out. We, you know, if you add up all tax delinquencies from all previous years, uh, including penalty and interest, it's about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So <laughs> when you figure that we we bill thirteen million dollars. It's it's pretty good collection rate, and uh, we have a tax sale that is going to be scheduled sometime in early February to deal with some of the older ones. Anyway, um, so the revenues to note, uh, if you look at that yellow line uh, in the middle of the page there, the state grant, that's the money that comes in to uh, reimburse us for what Barb Fire is uh, doing on the Main Street reconstruction project. Uh, we budgeted $65,000 for 2019. Uh, the 58,581 is what we've billed out through November for reimbursements. Uh, Barb told me this morning that the December reimbursement is going to be ready. So I think the total reimbursement for 19 is actually going to be about $63,000. So it's a, a, just a couple thousand dollars off of what we anticipated. Um, <clears throat> the 65 that I've proposed there for 2020, I'm still working with Barb. Um, I think that's the number it's going to be, but I don't know for certain yet. Um, the other things that to, to note, um, the pilot payment, which is under other governments, three lines down in that second section. Um, we budgeted 204, we received 204. The balance uh, went into the paving fund and we had some additional, and I think you remember the last meeting, we decided to move the, the extra money into the, into the recreation CIP to offset a deficit there. Um, I'm ex anticipating right now a 2% increase in the pilot payments from the state. So uh, 208 next year is the number. 
Um, excuse me, at the top of the page. Do you mind if I ask what, what what's, yeah. what's driving that? Just uh, in rate of inflation type. Well, yeah, so the funding source for the pilot payment is the local option taxes right. that the communities are doing and inflation, you know, so something that cost $100 last year might cost $102 this year and the 1% local option tax is on a, on a higher, higher sales value. So it's been going up. Um, uh, yeah, but isn't pilot based on appraisal of state facilities or state assets? That well, there's there's a couple of components to the formula. So the state pays based on the insured value of their property. Mm -hmm. That should not be changing right. dramatically. Um, the other part of the equation is how much money they generate from the local option taxes. Oh, yeah. And that part of it should be increasing a little bit because so sales good. costs. So I think it'll go up a little bit. Yeah, because I was I was kind of thinking to myself, how can the appraisal, yeah, go it's, up? I mean, something else must be well, driving it's that. It's the generation of local option taxes yeah. that yeah. that drives it. Yeah. And know. then of course you know uh, the state hasn't done anything yet, but they're still contemplating some additional renovation at the uh, state complex, you know, if they do anything with Wasson Hall um, or, you know, tear down Stanley Hall and build something new, there's potential that it could go higher yet. But this is just based on the sales uh, levels, Chris. Mm -hmm. At the top of the page, um, <clears throat> I have reduced a little bit the uh, penalty and interest um, revenue from delinquent taxes and I've reduced those a little bit because our delinquency rate continues to drop. I compared things back to, uh, you know, back late the first decade of the 2000s, about 10 years ago, and um, tax delinquencies when, you know, the economy fell off the cliff after the whole banking debacle and everything else, uh, delinquencies were much higher. We were collecting, you know, in the $30,000 range for those uh, penalties and interests. And, and now, you know, we, we weren't able to make 25000 on the on the, uh, the interest and not, not made 28000 on the penalties. So I adjusted those down a little bit. I adjusted the village administrative service fee down from 98000 to 90000 um, the, uh, there used to be a fairly complicated formula as to how much the village would pay the town. Uh, and back probably around 2013, the two boards agreed that we would just use, instead of recalculating that formula every year, because all the players basically stayed the same, it was my pay and the pay of the of the other staff people that do things for the village and, and office supplies. That was fairly constant. So we, we started to just uh, uh, add an inflationary component there. So, you know, if they paid $95,000 last year, we'd increase it by whatever the CPI was and they'd pay, you know, 96200 this year. Um, the 98000 uh, was 100000 a couple of years ago when the village disbanded and went away and the police department went away, my administrative work for the village was cut dramatically. I only reduced it by $2,000 from 100,000 to 98, from 18 to 19. Uh, the EFUD commissioners asked me a year ago to kind of do a time study, if you will. I did that mainly with my time and, and, and Karen's time because Karen is the tax and the utility billing clerk. She's the employee of the municipal secretarial staff here that works most for the, for the utility district. And uh, it, it really does show that it should be less. So um, I'm proposing 90. Um, I think the EFUD commissioners will be happy with that. Um, traffic control income a little bit higher than we budgeted, so I 
bump that up to 4,000. Forest and parks and current use. Uh, the forest and parks is on a schedule, so I'm pretty sure that 91 is, while well, I know it's, it'll be slightly below what's going to come in, um, I think we're scheduled to get 91.3. <coughs> and the current use <coughs> fluctuates a little bit, <coughs> but it will be in that, that area. Um, nothing else. Significant there, Duxbury Fire contract we already talked about. In the, oh, go ahead, Chris. Does Forest and Parks, uh, I just saw a little blurb on, on the news the other night about uh, the increase in federal monies that the state's supposed to get, and uh, I saw a pretty substantial increase in the uh, Waterbury Dam uh, line item. Uh, does Forest and Parks have anything to do with that? No. So um, the, the <coughs> forest and parks, so under the pilot program, the money that we receive, that 204000 that I budgeted 208000 for 2020, mm -hmm. that's for buildings. So on the pilot list, in addition to the state office complex, all the lean-tos and and you know uh, sheds and and uh, you know staff buildings that are in Little River State Park. Those are all buildings. We get paid for those buildings on from the pilot payment. <coughs> the really yeah, the forest and parks payment is essentially the current use payment that the state is giving us for all the forest land. So Putnam State Forest, Mount Mansfield State Forest, that's what they pay us. And, um, you know, they bumped it up considerably a couple of years ago. It's still a fraction of what it would be if they were, even if they were, you know, private landowners in current use, they'd be paying more than they're paying. But that's what that is. And then the current use, of course, is that's the use value appraisal program and people who have forest land or farmland and, you know, they meet the state's criteria. Uh, the state pays us that uh, in exchange for the reduction in taxes that those folks get on their, their own tax bill. So that's what the forest and parks is, Chris. It has nothing to do with the money that they get to operate the dam or to maintain the dam and that kind of stuff. So how does the dam come into play in this budget? The dam comes into play in this budget only, only in the fact that uh, Green Mountain Power uh, has value in that dam for its electrical so generation. that would be under the grand list. And, and it's in the grand list and, mm -hmm. and we generate taxes. They, we get less taxes now than we used to because they've changed how that dam operates. They, it's a run of the river operation now they can't uh, they can't store water anymore they used to have a uh, basically a four foot <coughs> differential they could raise the summer pool by two feet in the summer and then draw it down two feet below so they had four foot of head they could hold that water back for peak demand purposes and sell it at the highest rate through the wheeling sy system now whatever comes in goes out they can't, it's not a peak demand uh, dam anymore. So their, their uh, grandless value has been uh, taken down a notch because of that. So I'm wondering what that 20 million appropriation is. <coughs> well, it might be, you know, the dam, needs, the, the dam needs repairs. The tainter gates, uh, the tainter gates need uh, to be repaired. Uh, they can't. You know, the state's goal is going to be, uh, you know, their last FERC license uh, for the operation of that power dam there requires the pool to be maintained year-round at the summer level. Uh, there's not going to be any more winter level. Uh, they're going to deal with, uh, you know, spring runoff by closing the gates uh, as opposed to lowering the, the pool in the winter. But they can't do that until they fix the tainter gates. And, and, you know, if they got, I'd be surprised if that $20 million is going to 
prepare those, they might get some study done. But I, I didn't see the report, so I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. $20 million was the estimate for the repairs, 15 years ago. Yeah, I know we... No, what? Number two, uh, <coughs> if they try to close the gates at this point, things have shifted, so they might not be able to open them. It's, and, and so they have to take out all the three gates that are there now and replace it with two larger ones. Yeah. But they do close the gates now. It's just that they're concerned that they, they don't work as well as they should. Well, I knew a few years ago, because we talked about this a couple years ago, that that project had been kicked out quite a distance here. Right. Uh, so I didn't know if they were actually going to start working on that with this appropriation, but that's that's another yeah. discussion. So. so that really has nothing to do with no. the, our budget. No. Um, moving on uh, on these revenues, if you go down to the middle of the page, the service fees. Um, maybe, Carla, you want to tell them about the town clerk's fees. You know, the budget has increased by $25,000 there in terms of what the expected revenue is. All right, and the, the reason for that large increase is that the legislature passed increase in fees, recording fees, uh, mylar fees, vault time, pretty significant increases as of July 1. So that's why we're far over budget on revenues. So that's money that we take in, but a portion of, a portion of it goes to the state? No. No. This is money. It's all money we take in that goes to the town. Oh, so they just raised the rates for the municipalities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had so been raised in about 10 years. So. The, the, it's, a, it's a battle with the legislature. I mean, on the one hand, it's good for consistency. You know, if you're a, an attorney and you're going to go into the land records in Waterbury and you're going to go into the land records in Duxbury and you're going to go into the land records in Montpelier, it's nice to have it kind of a uniform rate, but the legislature really has a pretty tight control on almost all the fees uh, that we have to collect. Um, but they did increase it as of July 1st, 2019. It went into effect. And I think you told me, Carla, that of the 74,000 that we took in in 19, about 45,000 came in since right. July. So 45,000 times two would be 90,000 hedging the bets a little bit. My, I didn't ask Carla this, my anecdotal estimate, I guess, is that we probably get more fees toward the end of the year than we do at the beginning of the year. There's not a lot of construction that's happening now in the world, and property transfers, I think, typically take place more in you know better months of the year than now. So anyway, $85,000 is, uh, welcome addition to the budget, uh, $25,000 higher than last year. Uh, we've already talked about the recreation fees. Um, did they approve the fees that Nick? No, they didn't. Do you want to do that? Oh, or do you, that sheet that he, the, yeah, yeah. Do you want to uh, just make a motion to? I'll make a motion to approve the fees as presented uh, by the rec director. Effective immediately? Effective immediately. I second that. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. So we've talked about the recreation fees. Uh, Steve will be here next week. Uh, we'll talk about the planning fees. Um, I think the recommendation we're going to have is to uh, leave the planning fees alone. This year, I budgeted the, the same as we budgeted last year. Uh, we took in slightly more than we budgeted. I have asked Steve and Dina both to do some research in other towns. It's been a number of years now since we've changed any of the zoning fees, and we, just like with the rec fees, we should kind of keep up with what's going on elsewhere. But uh, we're not going to have that study done by early enough to implement this year to change the budget anyway. If they get it done, we might be able to put it in place later in the year, but I think for now we'll leave the uh, budget the same for that. Planning fees. Um, and then the last thing, the investment revenue. 
uh, which is second from the bottom section there. Um, we had another good year in the tax stabilization fund. Uh, Carla just got the statements and balanced them today. I was able to see them online the other day, so I have a pretty good idea of what <coughs> of what happened. <coughs> um, we the town meeting last year authorized the uh, transfer of up to five percent of the final value of the fund um, to the to the general fund, and uh, that fund for the first time ever uh, now is above a million dollars. Uh, so fifty thousand dollars is not quite five percent, mm -hmm. but I think it's close enough. Mm -hmm. It's a couple thousand dollars higher than last year. Um, on that note, just so you're aware, I um, have a meeting tomorrow with the town's uh, financial planner and brokerage uh, firm where we have our investments. And I've been analyzing the year-end statements uh, probably going to take some money, you know, we've had a couple of really good years, uh, take some profits, if you will, uh, and take some money out of the mutual funds that we have. If we can find some reasonable fixed income um, uh, investments to, to put that money in, do that. If not, just leave it as, as cash for now. Um, you know, it's Every once in a while, we should do that, and, and I think we'll probably take some investments off the table. The stock market is still almost at its all-time high right now, um, and you know they're forecasting at least before this whole uh, issue with Iran has taken place that you know next year is forecast to be a modestly good year, not as good as this year. But um, I think it's wise to maybe rebalance. So I'll be uh, doing that probably tomorrow. So just real quick, it, it, something that was on my mind when I did see that, um, the whole issue with Iran and uh, you know, the prospect that uh, oil prices may increase you know, moving forward that may end up affecting when we get to it, and we'll have that discussion, yeah. but our paving uh, abilities. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, the <coughs> I have already started to factor in, who knows what it is, uh, but <coughs> I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, 10% increases in fuel costs right now. Mm -hmm. uh, at this stage of the game, probably, uh, if the paving, uh, if the asphalt costs spike, you know, unless you uh, give me different directions, it's just going to mean we're going to pave a little less yeah. or we're going to have to, you know, figure out how to spend more. We've got really the one road in the budget this year. You know, we're lo looking at Howard Ave as we, we had Maple Street and then one other smaller road that we could fit in with the half million dollars that we're talking about. So. We'll keep an eye on things and see what happens. When will we be getting uh, bids on those? Oh, not until a uh, few months anyway. Okay. So, any other questions on the revenue side of things? Nope. Not for me. So, uh, our non property tax revenues, I, I calculated it yesterday, I forgot to write it down. Um, our non-tax revenues are higher than they, they were budgeted last year, uh, and that's always a good thing. Um, so lastly, the general government budget of the general fund is on the next page. Um, you know, there's, there's other budgets, fire department, rec, planning, special articles, uh, health, public safety that we're not going to talk about tonight, okay. just the general government portion. And really, there's, uh, there's almost no change there. Uh, I'll go through it line item by line item if you want to, but right now I budgeted 937750 
as opposed to 920-265, that's a 1.9% increase. Uh, the last I looked, inflation was running between 1 and 2%, so that's kind of right on the money. Uh, the two lines that are in yellow, uh, I think the amount sent to the Municipal Building Operating Fund uh, might be a little less than this. Um, what was in yellow? Here. I don't have yellow. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. So that 45000 is a placeholder. That's what we paid last year. Um, I'm still debating there. And then the county tax line, that's something that I just have to wait on. I estimated 5% increase on that. Um, it's based on our grant list. Uh, I think I told you last year, Waterbury is now, I believe, the second uh, property. The property values in Waterbury are second only to Montpelier in Washington County. We're higher than Barry, uh, higher than Maybe it's third. Maybe Barry Town's a little ahead of us. But anyway, um, that's a number that I have to wait to get from the county treasurer. I usually get it sometime in January, but my estimate right now is 63895 I'm hoping it might be less. I don't think it will be more, but I don't know yet. Um, there's really nothing else at this point that I want to talk about. On the, on the two municipal building operating fund, there's two places that we transfer money to Fund 76, and the library does the same thing. One is from this line, and then the other is from the debt management line, which I don't know. I think, I think you have that. But um, the debt expense uh, will be going down slightly uh, because we have a declining amortization schedule. Um, I put a note in the budget in my budget notes last year to look at the fund balance of Fund 76. We couldn't do it uh, right away because, well, we were just still dealing with the, you know, the upfront costs of this building. And then within a couple of years after coming into the building, we decided that we should spend $100,000 to put a generator in. But the note that I put in my uh, budget notes, which you don't have here, is that I would like to see, after five years of being in this building, uh, that the fund balance in Fund 76 would be $20,000, so that we have some money when it comes time to start dealing with mechanical uh, replacements, painting, electrical upgrades, what, whatever have you. Um, the fund balance for Fund 76 right now is about zero, where we came into this building on January 1st, 2016, so this is four years. So at the end of 20, all things being equal, I'd like to see $20,000 in there. And that basically I'm saying if we could put $4,000 a year aside into that fund balance, it would be a, a beneficial thing to do. So if we keep going as usual, uh, the, the, the Fund 76 should have lower expenses in it this year because the generator is fully paid for. So um, I want you to think about that a little bit. And when, I, when we get to talk about Fund 76 in a couple of weeks, yeah. we'll talk about this, obviously. The money that comes from the general fund that goes to those capital funds or reserve funds affects the tax rate. And if we can't because it's going to you know, make the tax rate too much of a burden right now, I'd just like to plant that seed that we should start doing that. Uh, we haven't been able to do it yet, but I think yeah. it's time that we should start. So you're suggesting you start with a $20,000 base and then just an annual 4000 <laughs> Well, what I'm saying is that by the end of 2020, it would have been nice to have a $20,000 cushion there. Right. If we can't have it, right. we should continue to push towards having a $4,000 per year surplus. So at the end of 10 years, we should have 40000 in that fund is what right. I'm saying. We might not need to get there all at once, but I'd like to start getting there. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's a minimal, I mean, ideally. Yeah, and on a, on a $3 million like dollar or a, a yeah. $5 million project, you know, $5,000 or $10,000 a year would be better. But it's a per exactly. very tiny gotta, percentage. Yeah. We've got to do what we can do. Yeah. No. Understood. So um, with that, I've finished my formal presentation tonight. I, I will say, Chris, just before you ask the question, I did send out the entire general fund budget revenues and expenses. So uh, I told you that we budgeted for revenue uh, 2921270 We took in 2853000 For expenses, we budgeted... 2,910,540, so it almost looks like an exact copy of the other number, but there's a little bit of transposition there. Um, we spent through the end of December 2,893,000, so we're about $17,000 to the good on expenditures right now. There will be some more expenditures posted back to 19, but uh, all things being equal in the general fund, we're going to be within a couple percentage points of where we thought we'd be. I think it's been a good budget year. Um, I believe we'll have a modest deficit in the highway fund, um, the library fund, a small surplus. And we did start the year with more money in the bank than we thought, um, than I thought, which is a good thing. The transition from Bill Iacovone to the new auditors, uh, 2017 was the first year that they audited. They didn't get to that until the end of 18. Um, and, you know, we didn't get to audit 18 until a little earlier this year than we did last year. But um, as I get more used to how they want things presented and how they uh, say we should do things, uh, I believe the, uh, the differences between what's on our financial statements and what they're ending up uh, showing as audited numbers are getting closer together. Uh, but we had a higher fund balance coming into 19 than I thought, which is a good thing. We'll be able to carry that forward. So uh, I'm a long way from being able to tell you what the tax rate for 2020 yeah. is going to be. But uh, the 2019 budget, I think, overall is positive news. Mm -hmm. Why did the um, commercial audit number go way down? <coughs> yeah, I wondered that, too, when I saw it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the bigger question for me was, why did we budget $30,000 or whatever it was? Where is the commercial audit? All right. so. Um, what happened was Where is the commercial audit? it's on this, it's on the uh, second just page. Just above the second yellow line. Okay. Yeah. So we budgeted thirty thousand two hundred five. We spent thirty two thousand two forty six, and I'm budgeting twenty two seven. Um, when we put that project out to bid, they gave us a, a schedule for the town from 2017 through 2022. Um, oh, okay. And the number that they gave us for 2019 was more like 21,000. I'm saying, why did I put 30,205 here? Well, it's just, they ended up doing the work later. So if we look back at what they charged us in 2018, it's about, you know, half this amount, so it's it's just where it fell in the, okay. in the calendar. And I think the 22-7 number is, is going to be more in line for what it will be this year. Gotcha. I looked at that yesterday. <laughs> I looked at the detail and said, well, okay, we spent a lot less in 18 than we budgeted. We spent yeah. a lot more in 19. Uh, I figured 19, it was an so. overlap. Yeah, that's what it is. So to... <clears throat> just get a comment there about the auditors. Uh, are you seeing a substantial difference in the way things are being done and is there a degree of more, di more difficulty on your part because of it or do you think over 
Well, it's getting things. easier. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the transition year was very difficult. Um, they do things slightly differently than Bill Yacoboni did. Um, Bill Yacoboni, there are things that we never did before, and it doesn't really apply to the town, but for instance, in the, in the utility district, the water and sewer departments are their proprietary funds, which means, unlike government funds, they run more like a business as opposed to uh, government accounting for, for general fund operations. So in the, in the water and sewer departments, they have debt just like we have debt in town. But the debt in the water and sewer departments is supposed to be shown on the balance sheet and the, the payment is supposed to be out, off of a liability line as opposed to out of an expense line. And, you know, that was like, what? And so we had to adjust how we posted all of that stuff. I have to, uh, for the village or for the utility district, I have to calculate accrued interest. So if we pay a bond, on, you know, make a principal payment on a bond on November 15th, and then the next principal payment is until the next November 15th, and the interest is $100,000 for the year. I have to take the $100,000, I have to divide it by 365 days, and then I have to multiply it by the 45 days that are in this year and charge that interest. So all those things I learned from them in 2018, and the, the 2017 audit for the town and village was very, very difficult to do. Um, and, and getting our books in order was very difficult. Once we did it, and I understand why we did it, how we did it, now I'm trying to do that. So 2018's audit was much easier than 17's audit. And I talked to the auditor today, and I said, I think that our, our financial statements are going to be almost exactly like you want them now. So moving forward, it's going to take less time than it did. But uh, the first couple of years were uh, a lot of time spent. And I joke with them and say, you know, there's, you know, the, the one person in the town that I knows, know who reads the audit report is me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else reads the whole thing. Right? Uh, anyway, you just have to learn a whole bunch of logarithms to get. The <laughs> but I'm, I'm. It's better than it was. Yeah. So. Good. They charge more than the old one did too, though. So. <laughs> so we have to do more work. They get more money. So it comes to mind there that uh, you know, your term here may be shorter lived than the rest of us probably want to see, but. Whoever may come take your seat, uh, I hope they're reasonably versed in doing the same thing. Right? Well, that's going to be up to whoever hires them. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I did mention a few years ago when Leanne was retiring that it might be time to think about a finance director. Um, I still think that's something that should be thought about. I'm not sure, you know. I've grown into this job. I did not have the skill set when I was hired in 1988 that I have now. Now, on the other hand, we didn't have then what we have now for money. Uh, you know, we had a general fund in the town and the village and a water and sewer fund, and that was basically it. We didn't have capital funds. I helped create those. We didn't have tax stabilization funds. We didn't have investments. So, you know, I've learned a lot along the way. And, uh, you know, I'm still not uh, an accountant, um, but I can, for a long time now, I've been able to work with the bookkeepers and say, okay, I think we fixed this this way, we got to post this transaction that way, uh, and I just describe some of the things that we have to do to put the financial statements in the form that the auditors want to see them. Um, most town managers that I know don't have Big time accounting skills. You know, it's a it's a different skill set. I was going to ask you. You know, the town manager in Stowe fairly well. Does, <coughs> does he also deal with the same 
things that you do, or do they have somebody? He has a, your sister-in-law works oh, there, that's too. So he has a finance I, department. So she, he, has, he, has, <coughs> he has a finance director. <coughs> the finance director has two or three bookkeepers. Uh, they have a whole department that does what, what Michelle, Carla, and I do here. So anyway. Yeah, I was there. <coughs> Motion to adjourn. I, I just have one comment about uh, the no. okay. paving. Um, it seems like um, sort of general knowledge that you get better prices for paving projects, don't you, if you uh, advertise them in the winter when people are looking for work and a little hungrier than waiting later. I don't know that we we'll exactly Has know anybody looked gonna... at that or is that something to think about? We haven't talked a lot about it yet. Okay. So I just thought we're, I'd put that out there. We're, I've told the public works folks that we're going to put it out to bid this year. Uh, and a lot on their plate. We'll do it when we can, Jane. Okay. But, um, Carla reminded me you should sign this fire contract with Duxbury. We'll send it over to them. And then they won't sign it until after their town meeting and send it back. Then we can have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? I second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 aye.